The staple form of speculative working-class housing in Leeds was the row of back-to-backs, right up until the 1930s. These ones are good examples, scullery houses at five shillings a week in groups of four with outside privies and ash pits interspersed between each block. Many were in very poor condition. And yet whatever we might think of this type of housing, the communities it provided were intimate, cohesive and friendly. Between 1895 and 1900, a 66-acre site down there, the Quarry Hill Insanitary Area, one of the very worst slums in Europe, was bought by the corporation. In 1935, construction began on the new Quarry Hill estate. The solution was dramatic. Between 1933 to 5, with the socialists briefly in power in the council, the city architect, R.A.H. Libet, designed this huge scheme. The site was ringed by a high, curving wall which protected the communal buildings and low ranges of single-room flats for the old and unmarried. The plan rode roughshod over the maze of little streets of the old slum area, replacing one complete way of life with another. The flats were built near the factories the bus station, and the markets and other attractions of the city centre. Here there were great advantages for the working man over a home in one of the outlying suburbs. Within sight of the city hall, Quarry Hill Flats seemed to challenge every conventional idea about working class housing. From 1933 to 5, a man was paid to carry boards up and down the hedgerow with the slogans Red Peril and Squandermania. And the imagery of the flats was recognizably influenced by dangerous continental and Bolshevik precedents. The inside of the crescent at Quarry Hill reminds us of European modern movement Siedlungen like Bruno Taut's Britz estate in Berlin. At Brits, Tout's balconies looked down into a green communal garden enclosed by a horseshoe range. The balconies and corner windows exploited the aesthetic possibilities of this arrangement. Livet too used these windows, a favourite cliché of the international style. Another source for his imagery was Vienna. Around 1930, the West Yorkshire Society of Architects went to see the socialist estates there. In 1934, Vienna was a cause célèbre, with the Heimwehr militia shelling the socialist housing strongholds. Some of this militant symbolism has rubbed off on Quarry Hill. We can recognise, for instance, a similar use of gigantic parabolic arches. The main entrance arch was lined up with the hedgerow. Let's look now at the estate in more detail. Construction began from the east end. The first houses were opened in 1938, but the last were only finished in 1940. This is the main entrance arch at the eastern tip of the estate. The first impression is pretty stark. Much of the original decorative detail, particularly around the staircases, has been removed, but the general layout is still very clear. On each side of each staircase, a balcony and a window belong to each flat. Despite the fact that the facades are composed of a range of standardised metal windows, Livet has managed to achieve a sense of individual character for each of the houses. The various blocks of which the estate is composed are organised into large-scale, easily comprehensible forms but Livet does what he can to make the order of the plan understandable. Here, for instance, he lines up two of his arches along a subsidiary axis. The effect of emerging through these arches and discovering new and surprising vistas 
provides part of the challenge of designing a large estate. As a whole, Quarry Hill works best on a large scale, as a sequence of vistas and blocks seen in perspective. When it was decided at a fairly late stage in the design to add a seventh and eighth storey to the blocks at the west end of the estate, Livett decided to incorporate electric passenger lifts throughout. The staircases, with the lifts at the back, are clearly expressed on the facades, flanked by the balconies. The provision of electric lifts was made possible by the constructional system used at Quarry Hill. In the French Maupin system, a light steel skeleton is constructed first. Whole sections of the steelwork, including here one of the lift shafts, were fitted into position. This was quickly erected by Booths of Bolton in 1935, a firm which specialised in industrial steel construction. But there matters rested for 18 months, while the building contractor, Tarran, tried to adapt the Mopar system to British conditions. Tarran invented a new method of fixing the precast concrete slabs, employing subsidiary vertical fixing posts with large bevelled lugs. Onto these, the precast concrete facing slabs were hung. The concrete slabs were originally faced with white Derbyshire spar and a dark gravel finish so that an effect of light and dark banding was achieved. An essential feature of such a standardised system of construction was that most of the flats had to be standardised as two and three bedroom pairs of flats, one on each side of the staircases. The flat plans are rigorously standardised, with the bedrooms facing outwards and the living rooms and balconies facing into the interior of the estate. As much as possible, this side of each flat always faced the sun. The electric lifts are extremely small, just big enough for two adults or one sack of coal, but quiet and reliable. Many of the tenants have lived here since the flats were constructed and are very happy. The living rooms look inwards. The centre of attraction here is the Garshi refuse station and laundry. In the living room, there's a coal fire. On the other side of the wall is the kitchen range, a combined oven and back boiler for the hot water. The balconies were not really intended to sit out on, but as a kind of multi-level backyard with access to a coal hole. They open off the kitchen rather than the living room, and in this way the service emphasis is increased. The kitchens are very small, but well designed with fitted working surfaces and tiled walls. One of the most extraordinary features of these flats was the sink, with its outlet into the Garshi refuse disposal station. Down this wide outlet, you could put anything from newspapers, bones, bottles or ashes from the fire. Where it all goes to will be revealed later on. The bathroom next to the kitchen was equally compact and inventive. Over the end of the bath an ingenious hand basin was placed where it could take up least space. The same taps were used for both but the outflow pipes were separate. Let's look now at what happened to all the rubbish that went down the sink. After being collected in an underground sewer system linking the whole estate the refuse is drawn out by suction to the Garshi refuse station. The vacuum pump deposits the semi-liquid sludge in two large tanks. When full, the
The solid matter is sucked out along these overhead pipes into hydro extractors, which spin out the water by centrifugal force. Then the half dry material is incinerated in the basement. Originally, this machine in the corner, the so called economizer, used part of the heat from the incineration stage to warm the steam for the laundry on the floor above. Every tenant had the right to use this laundry against a small charge on the rent. The washing machines were added after the war, but originally only these washing troughs were provided. But the hot air drying racks are also original, based on the kind extensively used in Vienna. There was also a well-equipped pressing and ironing room with a row of tables graded by height for ironing and folding clothes. The original equipment is still there but hardly used. The windows are arranged in a concertina pattern. Outside, built into the concrete window surrounds, are flower planters. The ironing room dominates the communal heart of the estate. Grouped underneath the laundry is a row of shops which face onto the Garden of Rest. The original, irregular expanse of grass, nicknamed the Village Green, was replaced by an officious planning department with these very formal flower beds. The lodger of concrete columns forms an attractive, semi-enclosed space for people to stop and gossip. The Garden of Rest, however, has become rather bleak, particularly after the removal of the benches. And where the community centre was to have been built, in the middle, there is only a single-storey play school. It's typical of the planning of Quarry Hill that the centre is dominated by functional services, the laundry and the chimney of the Garshi system. Now, in the spring of 1975, they're already preparing to pull Quarry Hill down. And yet, have the lessons been properly learnt? The main faults have resulted from a loss of will on the part of the Leeds Corporation to finish the job properly. All over the estate, communal facilities have been allowed to decay. This play shelter is now used for rubbish. And this space, intended as a playground, has been asphalted over. Although over 80% of the site is not built on, very little of it is really usable in any way by the community. Seen in the right light, though, the great ranges do look heroic and rather magnificent. On the other hand, most tenants seem to like the actual flats, adapting and humanising the balconies, which are like backyards. It's clear that there's a feeling of community in the estate. But it is perhaps symbolic of Livet's insistence on functional amenities that the whole estate is dominated by the tall stack of the Garshi refuse station. This is very different. High Point One, Highgate, London, a luxury block of flats designed by Berthold Lubetkin and his partnership Tekton in 1935. From the entrance, you bear left into a single storey space referred to as the Winter Garden which opens off the main ground floor vestibule on the right. The ceiling of the winter garden is left rough with the concrete beams exposed. The big window on the left is composed of glass bricks. The vestibule runs down the spine of the building, 
with a lift shaft and stairs at each end. The formal detailing of the concrete flower beds and stairs is extremely refined. This is the ground floor plan. You can see how the winter garden provides a roundabout access route to the middle of the building. The staircase and lift shafts are both equally accessible from the vestibule. It is lit by overhead clerestory windows and electric ceiling lights. This is the entrance to what was a tea room for the tenants. It's in the basement at the south end of the building, but the split level site gives it a magnificent view over the gardens. The sequence of elegant and spacious vestibules and halls which we've just been looking at clearly mark this building out from the working class council housing of Quarry Hill, Leeds. But High Point One is not only much more opulent, as you'd expect from luxurious apartments for well-to-do professional people, but Dubetkin has conceived the building as a work of architecture in the grand manner. Like Le Corbusier's Pavilion Suisse of a couple of years earlier, the building can be considered as a sophisticated marriage between standardized apartment cells up there and individualistic, beautifully sensuous curving forms in the public areas down here. Lubetkin has exposed the reinforced concrete frame of the building to lift it off the ground. Curving screens of concrete symbolize the rhythm of the landscape and the circulation of people and serve as a foil to the squareness of the rest of the building. Behind the screen, a miniature ramp linking the tea room with the gardens. The curving profile of each balcony too links the landscape to the angularity of the blocks of flats. Notice how Lubetkin has exploited different colours and textures, as here on the tea room, to separate supporting from supported. These brick-walled rooms under the body of the building were the bed-sitting rooms for the maids. And this is the outside of the winter garden which we saw earlier. It brings us back to the front of the building. The central problem of designing any block of flats is a constant one. How to compensate in the communal services and amenities for the necessary standardization and compactness of the individual flat. So far, what we've been looking at can really be described as aesthetic amenities, the richness of form, the beautiful handling of sight, which makes this building beautiful to look at. And there's another example behind me here, the subtle way the concrete canopy is curved shaped to match the curve of the drive. But Dubetkin also handled the functional servicing of his flats in an extremely clever way. And I want to come and show you this now. Look how Lubetkin's used the reinforced concrete structure of his building to tuck the garages away under the bulk of the building. Over here is the tradesmen's entrance, and this gives access to a long spinal corridor running the full length of the building. There are two small electric service lifts which provide access for tradesmen and services within the block. At ground floor level, this line of service lifts was kept hermetically sealed from the main circulation system represented by the main stairs and lifts. All the flats in the block conform to one of two standardized plans. We're going to look at one like this. 
you can see how ingenious the double circulation system is. Each service lift serves two flats, one on each side, providing service porches which connect with the kitchen and entrance lobby. The flat plans are compact with a central corridor and small but efficient kitchens and bathrooms. This is the glass door leading to one of the service porches. In the main corridor, a reinforced concrete column occupies little space, but it carries the weight of the structure. The kitchen is on the right, while the bedrooms and bathroom are on the left. The living rooms are spacious and well proportioned, with a glass door leading onto the end balcony. One of the main walls has windows running almost its full length. The window opening mechanism we've seen before at Weissenhof. All the bathroom fittings were specially designed for this block of flats. The fittings are kept low and tidied up by the use of white tiling and hidden piping. If this is stark efficiency, it's also most tastefully done. The light switches are neatly fitted to the metal door frames. Thick cork for the hallway, metal white tiles for the kitchen. Again, specially fitted cupboards. Notice the enameled worktop on the left, which pulls out. This is where the refrigerator went, fed with coolant from a central plant in the basement. The fitted cupboards and built-in amenities make these kitchens, like the bathrooms, models for their day. Most of the fittings were standard throughout all the flats. This must be one of the most beautiful views in London, and Lubetkin exploited it with this roof terrace, complete with a space to sit out in the sun and a concrete canopy for if it rains. Le Corbusier admired this roof terrace as well he might, since it was based on his own prototypes. And it was Le Corbusier, when he visited High Point One in 1935, who coined the phrase, the vertical garden city, to describe the building. Now, the post-war rash of tower blocks, often inconsiderately used for working-class families with small children and inadequately serviced, we perhaps have the right to be skeptical about high-rise buildings. But up here, somehow the logic seems inevitable, and we are seduced. 